Well, good morning. Glad you're here this morning. And, um, you know, uh, we have been uh, involved in quite a political season in these days, haven't we? Um, uh, and I don't know how you feel about it, but, uh, but I'm okay that Tuesday's coming and uh, the, we're all going to go to the polling places and cast our votes. And then uh, I would be okay if all the political ads and hoopla kind of drew to an end. But uh, in fact, I was telling somebody, I said, I went for a hike with my boys yesterday at Valley Forge. I was gone for two and a half hours. I came back, I had nine messages on my phone for, uh, you know, for, you know, who to vote for and how to vote and all those sort of things. I want to say two things to you, okay, two things about the election. I've been pretty quiet, haven't I, this year about the election, but so two things I want to say <clears throat> as the body of Christ. First of all, the first thing that I want to say is that, uh, that we place our hope in Christ, okay? So now, now probably everybody here has falls somewhere on the political spectrum. And there's probably somebody else in this room that you can't believe falls someplace else on the political spectrum. Um, but nevertheless, here's, here's the reality of it. Um, we don't put our hope in a politician. We put our hope in Jesus. And, uh, and come Wednesday, I have great news for you. Jesus is still going to be Lord come Wednesday. So, so whatever happens, you know, uh, do not, do not portray yourself as someone who does anything else but put your faith in Christ. Okay? Sometimes we betray ourselves with our language, like the world's going to come to an end if this happens or that happens. Um, the last I understood, Jesus still controls all those things, right? So, but, so don't betray yourself. The second thing I'm going to say is no matter where you fall in the political spectrum and somebody else falls, as you, as you converse the next two days, um, act like you're Christian, right? Show the love of Jesus to everybody, no matter where they fall on the spectrum, all right? Just, just love, be kind, be good, and portray that. All right. Well, good. I've said my two and a half cents. So, but, uh, but anyhow, let's, uh, let's say a word of prayer. Jesus, we thank you so much uh, because you are our hope and you are our salvation. And uh, Lord, we just pray that uh, that revival would come to our land. Revival would come to us. That, that we would live again by your glory and your grace. That, uh, that you would heal our lands and heal our hearts uh, all across our nation, Lord. Do a work in us. We need you. And uh, Lord, we just uh, pray this morning that you'd speak to us as we, as we begin this new series about uh, difficulties and difficulties that we face in life and, and, how, and how we find you in the midst of it. So uh, work in us, Jesus, in your name, amen. So, so I don't know what impossible situation you find yourself in. I don't know what you look at in life and say, man, this is the pits I don't know whether it's a relationship issue, health, work, financial. I don't know what that, what that is for you. I do think, and I think it's probably because of maybe it was my father's training the whole time I was growing up. I do think, and it happens to be this way, I think for me a lot, is the pits that I normally end up in are pits of my own doing. You know, like I created the pit, you know, by, by either a, a poor choice that I made or, or I didn't prepare perhaps like I should prepare or, or I had the inability to hear and receive good advice. And, and, and maybe even like James, right, the, the brother of Jesus writes in the scripture when he says that, that we're dragged away and enticed by our own evil desires. So, so I would say sometimes that the pits that we land in are, are like pits of our, pits of our own doing and, and. And we learn, right? We learn as we, as we walk through life. We can learn uh, patterns and we can learn principles that help us avoid a lot of pits in life. Um, you know, we can put them in the action. We can, we can learn to choose better. We can learn to follow the Lord. It's going to help us in, 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 in definite ways in our lives. And, and the writer of Proverbs kind of informs us of that. In fact, all through the Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. There's a lot of uh, pits we can avoid, right, just by, just by following Christ in our, in our lives. But, but every once in a while, every once in a while, we end up in a pit not of our own doing. We end up in a, a pit that, that we didn't design. I mean, we didn't choose it. It, it wasn't our sin that put us there. It, it, we just ended up in this pit because that's what happened. 
In reality, that's, that's Daniel's story. When you, when you read about Daniel in the lion den, that's, that's Daniel's story. Now, now, you can imagine when they rolled the stone behind Daniel and closed the entryway to that den full of lions, he had to ask himself, how in the world did I end up here? Because the truth is, if you know the story of Daniel, Daniel's kind of like the golden boy. He's kind of like the guy that, that even though his nation is in exile and his country's been defeated, he's kind of like the guy that always rises to the top. I mean, he's like the cream de la creme. Uh, like, for instance, the king of Babylon, you know, when, 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 when they began to, 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 to take Israel and began to move them into exile, the, the king of Babylon said, I want all of the, I want all of the sharpest young men in, of Israel to, 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 to serve me. So, so find the sharpest young men. And immediately Daniel was picked in that lot. He was picked as one of the sharpest young men of all of Israel. In fact, when all the sharp young men of Israel were together, you know, he creamed, so he rose to the top. He became the cream de la creme of the cream de la creme. And he, he kind of stood out among them. And, and very quickly, he was named like, like one of the top four of the, of the young men in Israel. And then, and then shortly after that, you know, they kind of knocked one off and got down to three. He was given some administration responsibilities to look over some things for the king and and God had gifted Daniel. So God was gifted as a manager, and he had given Daniel the, the gift of wisdom to interpret dreams. And, and, and then Daniel did this, and, and he did it well. And, and because he did it well, he, he excelled. And, and I don't know how many of you know that Daniel was actually about ready to be appointed second in charge of all of Babylon. I mean, he was going to be the king's, like, right-hand guy. Now, we know that about Joseph, right? But I don't know if we realize that about Daniel. Daniel was like, hey man, he was becoming the guy for the king in Babylon. So, so when the stone rolled behind him, and he is staring those man-eaters in the face, he had to think, how, how did I end up here? Well, well you know, in Daniel's case, it, it, it was the manipulation of, of evil men. Right, fueled by jealousy. Right, there were, you know, guys, or Babylonians who were upset about Daniel's meteoric rise, and so they wanted to cut him off at the knees, and 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 so they looked for some dirt on him, and they and they opened up all of his closets, but they just couldn't find any dirt, and they just couldn't find any skeletons in his closet, and and they say that. In fact, here's what they say in Daniel six five about Daniel. Finally, these men said. We will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So, you know, so in their minds, oh, man, we can't find anything unethical. We can't find anything that we can trip him up with. So, so the only thing we can go on is the differences in what he believes and, and where, you know, Babylon religion is. So they, in a very strategic way, pitted the king's ego against Daniel's devotion and love for the Lord. So they get together with the king, and they look at the king, and they say, hey, you know, king, you're so smart, you're so wise, you're so amazing, you're godlike. The king's like, yeah. And they go, you know, you're so much that way that, that we think it would be good for all of us, for the whole nation, if for a month we prayed to no God but you. You know, the king's kind of going, boom, 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 boom. You know, that's a good idea. In fact, we believe in it so much, you ought to make this a law, and then you ought to, you ought to decree that if anybody breaks that, if they pray to any other god, that they spend a night in the lion's den. Zero survival rate. And the king's like, hey, it's not a bad idea. So he signs onto the law, and, and it's made an edict throughout the land. Well, then Daniel goes home from the office that night. Does what he does every other night when he comes home from the office, right? Walks in his front door, sees his open window that points towards Jerusalem. He walks over by the window seal. He kneels down and in a very public way, prays. Communes with his God. Well, as much as the king hated it, and as much as he realized that he's just been manipulated... He has to do what he said he was going to do, right? So Daniel finds himself staring across 
a pit at a hungry Mufasa. And, and here's a bit of truth, right? Here's a bit of truth when you're in the pit. No matter how you end up in the pit, it's a dangerous place. The pit is just a dangerous place. Because the pit is dominated by one word. The pit is dominated by one concept. And that word is hopeless. The concept is there's a hopelessness that comes along with, with the pit. I mean, when you end up in the pit, and I don't know what the pit is in your life, when you end up there, I mean, this idea of hopelessness just is overwhelming to you. In fact, it, it says that in, in Daniel's story. Here, here's what it says in Daniel's story. Here the hopelessness. Daniel chapter 6, verse 17, it says, A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the dead. A very real physical barrier for Daniel. He wasn't getting out, right, of the pit. And the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles. So all the earthly powers that Daniel knew, anybody who could argue or be on his side or help him, none of them were. And then it ends this way. So that... Daniel's situation might not change. Wow. That's hopelessness. And write the phrase, so your fate is sealed. It's not changing for you, Daniel. The reason the stone was rolled and the reason the king and all the noblemen put their seal on there is so that your situation wouldn't change. You're in the pit and you're not getting out. Nobody's going to fight for you. Nobody's on your side. Nobody's going to do anything. When hopelessness gets a hold of you, man, that is a dangerous place to be. And many of us, many of us, we've been there, right? We've been at that place for whatever reason where, where we felt hopeless. We've landed in a pit where, the, where, we, where we felt like the stone was rolled and, and we're, staring, we're staring right across that pit at that which is going to devour us. I mean, we, we believe that. Now, now you know, when I began to, 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 to read the story and like, and, like, and like look at Daniel, what I was really excited about seeing is, okay, what did Daniel do while he was in the pit that, that really that helped him, right? Do you know what Daniel did when he was in the pit? You know what is he in the pit? Did you ever go to Sunday school? You know what my Sunday school teachers told me all the time? He prayed. When Daniel was in the pit, he prayed. Man, he fell to his knees and he prayed, God, help me, help me, help me. And God helped him. You know what's interesting? It just doesn't say that in the scripture. It doesn't say that Daniel, when he was in the pit, fell to his knees and prayed for God to help him. It's not in there. I mean, I, mean, I get it, right? Prayer's a good idea. And I get why my Sunday school teachers through the years would say, hey, Daniel prayed. Because, because if I was in that pit, I'd be praying. I'd be praying and I'd be running, Right? I mean, I'd be, I'd be doing, hey, Lord, do something here. I mean, absolutely, we get it. That's our go-to, right? When we feel down or somebody else feels down, how many times do we say, hey, I need some prayer? How many times do we say, I'm praying for you? And, and rightfully so, because prayer matters and prayer does make a difference. But it's just in this story with Daniel, it, it just doesn't say anywhere in the scriptures that he, that he prayed. It, in fact, it doesn't tell us any of his activity in the pit. It doesn't tell us anything he did. And in fact, Daniel 6.18, it tells us what the king did. It says here, the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him. And he could not sleep. But as far as Daniel's activity goes, all of the scripture is just silent on it. It's just silent on what he did in the pit. So, I mean, in, in reality, Daniel, Daniel, I guess, he could have brought his sleeping bag. He could have rolled it out. And he may have had the best night of sleep he had in six months right there in that pit. I mean, we just don't know, right? Because it doesn't tell us what he did. He could have brought some wood and a little starter and, and started a little campfire. Maybe he had a bag full of marshmallows and he roasted some marshmallows and he sang campfire songs. I mean, we don't, I mean, right? We, we don't know. It doesn't say what he did or what he didn't do. He could have brought some chew toys. And he could have went, hey, and he could have played fetch all night and maybe had a little top hat and a little whip, put on a little lion show just to entertain himself when he was down there. I mean, we don't know what he did. It just doesn't tell us. I mean, we make assumptions what he did based on what we would do and how we would react, but, but we really, we don't know. And then that kind of, kind of stumped me, you know, because I'm thinking, well, 
Why don't we know what Daniel did in the pit? Wouldn't that be important to us? I mean, why is it that Daniel's activity in the pit isn't even mentioned? And then this dawned on me, and I don't know if it's right or not, but it dawned on me, is that, is that perhaps, perhaps it's not mentioned because it wasn't what Daniel did in the pit that saved him. It was what he did before he was in the pit that saved him. Now, now you know what I mean there, right? We don't have any record of what Daniel did when he was in the pit, but we have a lot of information about how Daniel conducted himself before he was in the pit. Like, for instance, we know that Daniel knew God. We know that Daniel prayed. He communed with God. He had a relationship with God. I mean, we knew that Daniel was an active follower of God. I mean, he wasn't somebody who just said, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, I know him. He was somebody that, man, he lived uh, according to God's patterns in his life. We knew that, that, God, that Daniel was somebody who, who, who wanted God's wisdom and received God's wisdom. And he was somebody who trusted God. Because, because remember the story, even when he, when he first got in and, they, and, you know, they had this eating regiment. You know, Babylonians, they were, you're, you're coming in here, you're going to eat these things, you're going to do this. And Daniel's like, no, nope, I'm not breaking any of the pattern that I have in my, in, my, in, my, in, in my relationship with God. I'm not breaking any of that. And they were like, no, you have to. And he was like, give us some time and then you can compare. And then Daniel came out looking pretty good at the end of that. I mean, we know that Daniel was one who said, no, 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 I'm not, you know, I'm going to, this is my, this is who God is. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to veer off of that. And I'm going to live into that. You know, maybe one of the reasons, and I I don't know this, I'm not trying to like be judgmental because I'm talking about myself here too, is, is maybe one of the reasons that the pits of life seem so hopeless to us is that we don't prepare for them. And you know what, let me take that, let me, let, me, let me rephrase that, because that seems like a wrong way to approach this. It feels pessimistic. You better prepare for the pits that are coming in life. That feels kind of pessimistic. So, so, let's, so let's reframe it, let's look at it this way. When we fall in love with God, and we learn and we know who he is, and we have a relationship with him, he does something in us that helps us through the pits of life. Like, like as we walk on the journey with him and, and he lights our pathway and, 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 and we're falling in love with him and we're believing in, in who he is and, and we begin to see the world and we begin to see life in ourselves through his eyes. When we begin to understand that, that, that life isn't like just about what I want but that, that I'm here for his purposes and, and I have a mission and he's doing something in me and he's doing something through me. When, when that all of a sudden begins to, to resonate with us, God does something in us. That like helps us in the pits. As we, as we trust and lean on him day in and day out. Then when the pits come we just continue trusting and leaning on him. Well I don't, I don't right? who knows, who knows what Daniel's activity was when he was, was in the pit. It's, it's not recorded. But the scripture does record what God's activity was. Right, it, it tells us what God did. And that's, that really matters. Right? What God did when Daniel was in the pit really matters. So you know the king couldn't sleep all night long, right? He was tortured all night long. Finally, when the, you know, when the sun starts to come up, he runs from his bedroom down to, the, down to the lion's den. And he yells out, Daniel, are you there? And Daniel says, I'm here. And then in verse 22, this is what Daniel says. My God sent his angel. And he shut the mouths of the lions, and they have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. So so there's two things, right, that that Daniel said God did for him when he was in the pit. There's two things that, that God did. God was active, and here's two things he did. The first thing he did is he did not leave Daniel alone. Isn't that one of the scary things about the pit? Isn't that one of the things that, that when hopelessness gets a hold of us, we think we're alone? I mean, that's one of the Satan's main tools to get us down and depress us and to, and to put us in places that aren't healthy is we think we're all alone. And Daniel says, no, 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 the Lord sent his angel. I mean, I wasn't alone at all. We played some hopscotch. We played a little bit of cards. A little bit of, we had a long game of Monopoly going on. But, but I mean, no, I wasn't alone. God's angel was here with me. And God shut down the very thing that was intended to devour me. God did not let me be devoured. 
Man, that, that's important for us, right? It's important for us to understand God's activity when we're in the pit. Because when we understand that God's active on our behalf when we're in the pit, it helps us, it helps us flourish when we're in the pit. That's an odd thought, isn't it? Flourish when you're in the pit. Sometimes we're in the pit, it sure doesn't feel like we're flourishing. Even when we're really, when we're really flourishing, it doesn't feel like it. But how do we flourish in the pit? So I have, I, I, I have a thought or two about this. Here, here's my first thought on how we flourish in the pit. Is that, is that the pit does not define you. I mean, you have, you have to embrace the reality that, that the pit you find yourself in doesn't, it doesn't define you. Like, think about Daniel, for instance, in this story. I mean, did anything change about Daniel because he found himself in that lion's dead? I mean, did it change who he was? I mean, I mean, what was different about Daniel? I mean, I mean, Daniel was the same in his relationship with God, whether he was in the throne room, whether he was at home in his living room, or whether he found himself in the lion's den, right? Daniel was who Daniel was. I mean, he, he did not allow the pit to, like, like, define him. And you know what I think one of our big struggles is? This is one of our big struggles, is that, is that, is that we tend to give the pit power that it doesn't have we do that all the time. Man, we give the pits of our lives power over us when it doesn't have power over us. I mean, it, it, it doesn't have power to, to, to control our thoughts or it doesn't have power to determine our actions. It doesn't have that. The pit doesn't have that power, but yet, but yet in some sort of weird way, we, we give the pit power over our lives to define us and, and to change us. And, and, and here's what I find interesting about Daniel in this story. It's really intriguing to me, is if you read that whole story about Daniel, Daniel isn't even recorded one time before he's put in the pit or his time in the pit until after it's over. Not one time is he recorded begging for his life. Not one time when the king says, Daniel, you're going in the pit, does Daniel say, oh no, king, please no. No, don't do it. I'll never survive. I'll die in that pit. There's no hope for me. Never once did he respond that way. I mean, I mean when we look at it, we don't have anything recorded about that sort of activity in his life either. And another thing about him is, and you may find this really interesting, is he tosses no accusations. He doesn't look at the king and say, king, wait, you know what's going on here. You know those guys, they've been manipulating this whole situation and they're evil and they want me out of the picture. And, and, and man, you know how bad they are and you know they're not going to be good for you and, and, and you know they're going to do this to me. Never once does he make any accusations against those who have done wrong against him. That's pretty powerful. I mean, Daniel just wasn't going to let his circumstances define who he was. He wasn't going to cave in during those times and all of a sudden be somebody different because circumstances changed. I mean, he was who he was and, and, and nothing in his relationship with God changed because of that. And Daniel didn't give the pit power over his language. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Because how many times when, when we end up in, in like the pit of our lives that we allow the pit to control our language, right? Our whole language changes. Man, all of a sudden we're boom, 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 boom. We speak totally different. We, our, our, our concepts, man, we're just, we're just enveloped by this thing and it's got a hold of us. Well, one way that we like, like, like thrive in, in the pit is, is to not allow the pit to define you. The pit doesn't define you. I, I think another thing that's really important to us in this is, it, is to make sure that we don't let the, pin, the pit define us, but also that we don't let the pit define who God is. I mean, the pit doesn't get to define who we are, and the pit doesn't get to define who God is. But, I mean, that's, that tends to be our go-to, right? I mean, it's either like, hey, man, there's something wrong with me because I'm where I'm at, or then it needs to be, oh, there's something wrong with God. God, is this okay with you? I mean... I mean, because you have difficulties in life and because you go through struggles in life and, and it doesn't mean that God is less than. It doesn't mean that he doesn't care. It doesn't mean that he's silent. It, it doesn't mean that he can't do something about it. Do you remember when Jesus was talking to his disciples and he's talking to his disciples and he says, um, he says, oh, you've got trouble? I've got trouble in this world. You're not greater than me. I've got trouble. But you know what? I've overcome the world. 
the pit doesn't define who God is. Like, like for instance, we, we look at Daniel and, 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 we, and we see like this activity that's, that's happened, right? So, so the angel came down and, and he was with Daniel. Daniel wasn't alone and, 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 and the mouths of the lions were shut. And then the king comes down and listen to all this activity that's taken place, right? All of this that, that, that God does, right, in, in this pit situation. The king was overjoyed when he heard that Daniel was alive and he gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den, And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and their children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed their Now, can I tell you something? Daniel didn't even ask for that. Daniel didn't say, God, avenge my enemies. He didn't even ask for that, right? He wasn't saying, hey, do this and do that. Get them. I mean, that wasn't who Daniel was. It wasn't in him, right? But nevertheless, man, the pit didn't define who God was. God was still active. And, and, and I think about this, and I, and I love this verse. I, I love when Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, when he says, for our light and momentary troubles. Isn't that interesting? Man, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So even though you're like, you're like whoo, man, the situation's around me. This is the pits. Man, Paul's saying God's at work. God's doing something great. This pit doesn't define who he's in. He is active, man. He is doing something that far outweighs whatever it is that we think that we're going through at the time. So, I mean, so, so if we can, like, so if we can, like, if we can not let the pit define us, and then if we can not, you know, not redefine who God is in our mind, you know, because of the pit, an incredible thing happens. The pit gets transformed into the platform. I mean, the pits that we go through in life actually become our platforms. Like, like God does something and, 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 and God elevates those tough situations and he elevates them to a level by which all of a sudden now they're no longer a pit, a pit but it's a platform from which God is praised, from which he is exalted from which he receives like, 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 like worship from people and adoration because, because that pit's been transformed to this platform in which, in which God is elevated and, and exalted. Like, like Daniel chapter 6, listen to the, to the end of the story. The king wasn't done when he like said, hey, throw the accusers in the, in the pit. This is, listen to this. He goes on, it says in verses 25 through 27, then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth. So it's like, man, he sent like a decree out, right? To even beyond his kingdom, right? In every language, he sends this decree out. And this is what he says. May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. Now listen to what he says about him. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Did you know what happens in our life when, when those hard things and those hard times and those difficulties, man, when we don't allow them to define us and we don't allow them to, to redefine who God is to us, man, what happens is, is those times turn into platforms in which we praise God from, in which he is exalted from. You, you know, I, I don't know what the impossible situations are that you find yourself in. I, I don't know that. But, but you know what we all know in this room? It's the reason we gather here. You know what we all know? We all know a Savior that is not unaware of pits. I mean, we all know a Savior who, who has gone through difficult times, who, is, who has faced every trial, who has faced every temptation. We all know a Savior that, 
that, that literally, right, was placed in a pit, not alive, dead, after he already went through the cross. We gather here because we all know a Savior that was placed in a pit dead, and a stone was rolled over the entryway. And the ruler of the land took his signet and his seal and he put it on the stone so that his situation would not change. And we all know a Savior who walked out of that tomb alive. I mean, we all know a Savior that blew death out of the grave. I mean, we all know a Savior that took an impossible situation and flipped it on its head. And because he did that, that becomes our hope. Because he did that, that changes the way we view everything. Because of who he is and, and what he did. I mean, man, there's power in that. And, and so when we end up in the pits of our life, and we end up in, in difficult times, we understand, man, this doesn't define us. It doesn't define him. Man, he overcomes. I mean, that pit became the biggest platform in human history. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, man, it changed the world. And that's the Savior that we know. That's the Savior that we believe in. That's, that's, who, we, that's who we trust in. That's when we're down and, and we have those difficult times. That's, that's who we give ourselves to. That's who we know. And, and in fact, you know, like our rituals are tied up in that. Our rituals are tied up in this idea of pit sort of stuff, right? Think about baptism. You know what baptism is, right? You hear believer's baptism is coming up. If you've accepted Christ, you need to participate in it. But you get what believer's baptism represents, right? You know what the water is, right? It's the earth. The person gets taken under the water. Why? Death. They die to self. They get brought out of the water. Why? Because they've been risen alive in him. It's our story. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like our rituals are wrapped up. We're going to participate in a ritual today that's absolutely wrapped up in this idea of the pit. I mean, in a few moments, right? In a few moments, and we're going to, we're going to hold at our fingertips, and we do it every single month, bread and juice, and we're going to say, this is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was broken for you. That's pit stuff. This is the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you. That's, that's, that's pit stuff. Right? And then every month we go, man, this is what, this is where Jesus was. This is what he did. I mean, he's not unaware of difficult times. He's not unaware of, of hardships. He's not unaware of that. And we hold those in our fingertips and, and we celebrate that, that his death was sufficient for our salvation. But, but we don't simply stand on that. We stand on the cross and we stand on an empty tomb. That says the reason we can hold those in our fingertips is because he's alive. It's in everything we think. It's, it's all about who we are. So, so, in fact, this is what I want you to do this morning. As, as you get the, the elements in your, in your hands this morning, the broken body and the shed blood, I want you to take a, a moment, and I just want you to say, Jesus, man, I, I recognize that you know, you really know what pits are. You've traveled through the biggest pit in human history, all of our collective sin. You've traveled through that. And Jesus, I just want to take you a moment, and I want to tell you about my pit. And I want to ask you to help me not to be defined by it. And not to redefine you by it. But, but Jesus, can you take this pit of mine? And can you help me make it a platform where your praise is shouted? And the world has changed because of it. The ushers, they're making their way forward and, and we're going to worship today. Name your pit this morning. Let's celebrate our risen Savior.